Good afternoon, beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. This is episode 52, and we're joined by a repeat guest. You all may know her. Her name is Brittany Jones. She is running unaffiliated for President of the United States 2024. Um, we had a bunch of um, wonderful conversation. If you go back and listen to episode 26 on this same Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum, um, we would greatly appreciate it just to get the views up and also to get Brittany's campaign out as well. But I want to say thank you for accepting the invitation again and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. I, I enjoyed the first interview, so I'm glad I can be back. No doubt. This one should be just as memorable. And we're going to talk about similar topics and sort of expand on what we left off of um, from the episode 26. I just want to give a shout out to just um, all the dedicated listeners, viewers. This is a pod and a video version um, by popular demand because people were saying they want to see the people's faces. And I was like, okay, whatever. I'm going to make more emphasis on the YouTube channel because people do like visuals. And so I've tried to make an effort to do that more. And I just want to say thank you just to the international community. Um, we have about 35 viewership outside of the United States. And so it's really important that we um, bring in the international presence. And that probably has a little bit to do with my background, being in foreign languages and culture and having the types of guests that, that I've had on but it will probably continue to be very much an international driven um, conscious forum, obviously talking about domestic issues as well. But we're, we're probably touching on some of that today because um, that's one issue I've seen just um, following uh, American politics, U.S. politics for, uh, I guess, over 25 years now, because I'm, I'm a lot older than that, but I'm not going to claim that I was into politics when I was that young. But I say around 16, I got into it. But I noticed that I think U.S. candidates in general have a weak spot when it comes to foreign policy and international relations. And hopefully I can talk to Brittany about that. I can talk to Jasmine about that tomorrow, uh, someone who has also run for president of the United States, and the rest of the people that I'm interviewing just running for public office just in general, just to see where we are when it comes to um, awareness of the world, because we are a world, we're interconnected. And I just want the audience to know that we really can't have each other, you know, literally, we have to have each other to kind of coexist and to get through these um, complicated times that we're in, just like the generations before us. And so um, I want, I guess, to throw the table to Brittany and ask her, uh, what has your outreach looked like up until this point? And um, what have been some of the difficulties like breaking through whatever barriers you've had to break through? to get more public visibility. Absolutely, I'm actually glad you have international viewers because maybe they could uh, get their news stations to shame American news for not covering <laughs> unaffiliated candidates. <laughs> maybe the shame game will work for our stations. Um, I actually have a pinned video on my TikTok where an editor for a news station in Iowa refused to give me any airtime after they had already been out covering the event that we were at is a, it was a We Say Gay rally in Davenport, Iowa. And they had sent their reporter out, they had done coverage, but I was the only speaker that they got on video. And so they completely refused to air it on their network. They refused to show an entire event simply because I was the speaker and they won't give an unaffiliated candidate any airtime. And I feel like that comes from them feeling threatened that they know the American people are tired of Democrats and Republicans. They know the American people are tired of the two party system and the status quo with the corporations that we have. So someone who's newer, younger, vibrant, not part of the parties would absolutely smash any mainstream media um, access out of the water and probably be one of the top competing candidates. And that's a threat to them, especially with how many times I've gone viral on, on TikTok, especially. They, they don't want that type of viral candidate that's not a part of the two-party system on their platform. And that's been the biggest struggle. Do you feel like you need like more viral moments to, to keep that momentum going? Because I've heard you in um, previous interviews, you said something about um, you were bigger than Marianne Williamson or something. You were saying that your engagement was larger than Marianne Williamson. You was just making a comparison. Well, can you expand on those comments you made? I think you made that in, um, I think it's um, the Cowan of Witches podcast. It was a, a podcast about witchcraft, but I'm curious about. 
the Coven of Rejects podcast. Coven of Rejects. That was, Coven of Rejects. <laughs> that was an amazing podcast. Um, so yeah, before Marianne Williamson had announced that she was running, um, I had actually already been registered in December of last year. So I've been registered for almost a year now as a candidate. I've announced I'm running. I've gone viral almost. I was I was viral almost immediately. And no one really remembered Marianne from last election cycle until she was on a news station and they made it really big. And her following on TikTok was actually pretty small when she first announced she was running. And once she was on the news, it quadrupled and was started growing extremely quickly. And if you've noticed, she's already petering out. She's not as prominent as she was when she first announced. And they refused to have a primaries. The Democrats refused to have a primaries. They don't want the they don't want the uh, debates to go because they know Biden will not do well against another Democratic candidate. But that's not how it should be. Elections should not be handed to somebody. And what we're seeing is party over politics. The Democrats, even though they don't like Biden, they are still saying we're going to support Biden because he's a Democrat in office already. And that is where the American people are not being heard. And that's where mainstream media is failing the people because they could have a great story with my candidacy and who I am and how many times I've gone viral and how much support I have. I have people registering to vote for the first time. I have people switching parties. I have MAGA Republicans going to vote for me, which is really threw me for a loop the first few. No, I'm not surprised at all. Um, it was actually going to be one of my questions that I was going to ask later down the road. Um, well, not down the road, relatively quick, because we just talked about your visibility. And it's, it's all part of that nomenclature because we grew up identifying as one or the other. And then it's like you almost have to grow out of it. And then by the time you grow out of it, it's like you have a whole generation of young Republicans, young Democrats saying the same stuff that they used to tell us back in the day. And it's just like, it seems like that's what keeps it effectively going on. Is it's like a generational cycle of propaganda of just, you know, this side is the worst side, this is the better side. And it just seems like it never ends until someone, it, you have to have some kind of awakening to be like, okay, this is it. I absolutely agree. I used to be a hardcore Democrat when I was younger. Actually, I still lean left in my views. But what I've come to realize, especially with campaigning, are Republicans and Democrats are two sides to the same coin. Um, a lot of them are being backed by the same corporations on different aspects. They're they're working ultimately towards the same goal, and that's lining their pockets and staying in power. And some of the new ones I had hoped for, like AOC, um, I'm really hoping that she does. She she keeps up the good work, but I heard she's not running again. Katie Porter is doing an amazing job calling out the corporations and the inflation and the corporate greed. But the majority of politicians up in the federal offices right now are are very similar to each other. If you look at Biden and Trump, Biden actually passed harder asylum rules than Trump was going to. And he, Biden, despite promising to honor indigenous treaties, he has violated indigenous treaties. He has approved more oil pipeline permits than Trump did. And I don't like either of them. I'm, I, I have a lot to say on Trump, too, but Biden's the current president right now. So I'm going to focus on him. Just like any other politician, he got elected into office. He did the bare minimum to get votes as a Democrat. And he succeeded in getting into office and then once again did not follow through with their promises. They always do that because once they get into office, the corporations that got them into office have that pull and power over them. And it's time for that to stop. It's time for that to end. And you said it yourself, there are more unaffiliated and independent people than there are Democrats or Republicans. We actually outnumber them by 85 million people combined. And it would really be a simple thing if all of us just stood together, had an awakening and said enough is enough. It's time to get these, these corporate politicians, these greedy politicians out of office and get ourselves in office as it should have been by the constitution. I think I made a comment earlier about labels. I think sometimes labels are effective. They're used for reasons. I would I would say that in this situation, we we as the left, and which Democrats to me aren't part of the left at all. And um, Biden is a Republican. If if you look at his policies, there's nothing about him that's anything but a Republican. Um, 
that's the that's the case for most Democrats. Like that's I think I think we need to find a way to shift it over to window before we can effectively get messaging out because we've associated Democrats with the left and Republicans with the right. To me, I would argue that they're both right wing parties because you can't you can't say one thing, but then you have the same policies. <laughs> I mean, you just say yourself he's enforcing Trump's policies. So, I mean, that kind of kills the argument of this person is a leftist. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous that people even fall for that. But it, again, it's a messaging thing because they have to find ways to distinguish themselves from one another by language, but not by actions. And so uh, once we can show that the policies don't correlate with their actions, then we can maybe get somewhere. I think people are starting to demystify these terms and then realize, well, hell, the Democrats are doing the same thing that they're doing. They just they say it in a different way. The Republicans are doing it in a different way. And I think people are realizing that, but they don't know how to, I guess, kind of navigate that because it is confusing because we've been taught that this is this and that is that. But honestly, for me, studying politics, the Democrats weren't really a left party until they, back in the day when they had like union ties and like the labor movements, they were heavily invested in that. They were more left then. But now you have Democrats busting up unions. <laughs> they do the opposite. Now they bust up the unions now. So if anything, the Democrats have, have progressively gotten more to the right over the decades. And the whole military cheerleading has even confirmed my suspicions that the Democrats are probably just as bad as the Republicans when you talk about war spending. I mean, they're they're pretty much in line with the Republicans. They passed one of the largest military spending bills just in the last year. And we don't we don't need that much money for our military. I think we need to consolidate. <laughs> I think we need to consolidate our military. We don't have enough personnel to fill the positions as it is. We don't. And, We're spreading um, our thin. What kind of, in what capacity um would you envision the military? You were in the military, right? Yes, I was. I served for eight years. The last four years were absolute crap. Um, I do have a video up on that. I'll put on my YouTube explaining in depth that aspect of my military career. But I definitely face sexism and there's racism and they actually train you to be racist against the enemy of of whatever war you're in when you're in training. And it's it's a really toxic environment that needs accountability brought to it. There was Denisha Montgomery Smith, who was murdered in Germany. I do not believe for a second that it was suicide after a video of her getting assaulted by her fellow uh, soldiers came out. And another person who was speaking about her, another soldier was also found um, dead in his bunk. And they said it was a suicide, yet he had so much torture on his body that even the ba the bottoms of his feet showed signs of abuse. That's not a suicide. And there's there's cover-ups going on. Same with Vanessa Guillen. They said she was MMA. M and then AWOL. They said she was AWOL. And she wasn't, she wasn't. She was murdered and buried in a tote along the river. And when they were looking for her, I believe they found two other soldiers that were marked as AWOL that were also murdered. Mm -hmm. A lot of accountability needs to come to the military. We need a leader, a commander in chief who's willing to do the work to pull the reports, pull the sexual assault accusations pull the racist accusations, pull all the EEO complaints and actually get a get a, a task force that's separate from these units, from these companies, from these bases to do a thorough review of all of them and see who has been swept under the rug and who hasn't. Because there's no way that a rape victim should be kicked out of the military while their rapist gets to stay in and retire with full benefits. That should not be happening in any way, shape or form. And I also believe that we need to consolidate our military. We have 90% of the world's foreign bases. We spend over $55 billion a year on those foreign bases. With technology today, we don't need that many foreign bases for national security. There's plenty of other large nations that are, that are on par with us that don't have that many bases and their national security is just fine. We're also, I like to say in my lives, we're not Captain save -a we are in a network of allies. It's not our job. <laughs> it's not our job to be in every single country's business. We have allies, we have a network. It's time for them to step up or time for us to step back, one of the two. And when we consolidate our forces and reallocate that money to base housing, because there's black mold, there's dilapidated houses, there's not enough care for active, active soldiers, 
as service members. There's not enough care for veterans. Reallocate that money, reallocate that funding to veteran service, improving health care, child care for service members, support services for service members to make sure that we actually take care of our military. We may have the strongest, but in my opinion, it's by no means the golden standard. And we need a golden standard military where our soldiers are taken care of, where they're not broken, they're not beaten down. They they actually love to serve. They want to be there and get our recruitment numbers back up because it's a place where people want to be. It's it's get it back to what it's what it's about is protecting our country and protecting our people and serving for a cause, not serving because you need to pay for college or not serving because you feel like you have nothing else in life to do and people keep them in because they feel like they're actually heard and taken care of rather than them leaving. Because right now, no amount of money is getting getting recruits and they have recruiters working six days a week right now trying to get people in to fill positions because there's just not enough. People realize, people are seeing that, you know what, I'm not going to go die for a country that's not actually going to go take care of me. You said a lot there and I want to revisit what some of what you said. Um, I think there's definitely some underlying issues um, that are at play. I personally believe that people are fatigued of the military. Um, I don't think it makes those people like not be patriotic because I know when I was smaller, you were always told that you were not as patriotic if you didn't care for the military. And um, to me, that's part of the propaganda as well. I just don't think people want to see other humans getting killed by other humans. Um, it's a very dehumanizing sort of experience. Um, just the way the way people have talked about the Russians. I mean, do you realize that Russians are people? Like their government may have, they may have a bad government. Ukraine may have a corrupt government, but Ukrainians and Russians are still people. And I don't think we see that aspect because it's it's always focused on the tactics. It's always focused on making it a strong presence, you know, around the world. And you talk about de-escalating um, things to a certain degree. But I, I guess I was speaking more from would the military have a different function under a Jones administration um, as, as like building infrastructure here in the United States for our people, as opposed to worrying about drones and bombing other countries and stuff. And for me personally, it's just hard because if we're as smart as we say we are, how do we get from a point to almost like having nuclear destruction, you know, destroying, destroying the environment you mean to tell me we can't have diplomacy of any kind? Like it just automatically goes to war? I mean, we pulled out of Afghanistan and we went right to Ukraine and gave, and we, we've given them $75 billion almost. It's probably gonna be over a hundred billion by the time this is said and done. And I'm just like, what, whatever cause you wanna justify it as being, to me, it's still funding the military industrial complex. Find my unmute button there. Um, <laughs> I, I can absolutely see how the military can be used to strengthen the United States by bringing troops home, infrastructure, security, you know, assisting in a, in a lot of different things, humanitarian aid efforts in the United States. I know we have the National Guard for that as well and the Red Cross, but sometimes we need more. We have the disaster in Maui. We have the, the fire in Lahaina and we have the flooding in California. The, we have fires in Oregon. We have, I mean, we have a lot of things that the, the military could be used for. And one thing that people tell me I'm a dictator for um, with, there is a genocide going on on American soil um, towards transgender people. It's, it's getting amped up. Genocide does not just mean killing people. It means erasing them in any, there's many different steps to erase people, taking children, taking away books and literature, erasing history, stopping medical care. Those are all steps in genocide. And also we have the continued genocide against the indigenous people that is still going on. And as president, I do plan on doing a state of emergency. I, I foresee things being a lot worse next November during the election than they are today because things are accelerating at a rapid pace to take away rights from Americans. And I do plan on doing a state of emergency in conjunction with genocide on American soil and using American troops to make sure that people get humanitarian aid, can get medical care, can their children are protected. And people try to say that it'll be, it'd be setting a precedent in history, deploying troops on American soil, but we've already done it. We did it with the Japanese um, internment camps on American soil. We did it with desegregation when 
when the black kids needed to be protected going to school. The military has been activated on American soil for bad and for good. I intend to use it for good, to protect the transgender people, to enforce treaties, to protect indigenous people. And I intend to make America what it should be. And that's a safe place for people to be free. And people try to say we have freedom now. We don't. If you're too afraid to walk down the street openly as who you are, you are not free. Mm -hmm. And I want to make America actually free and safe. Do you have a danger? Do you do you feel that there's a danger of people viewing that as like identity politics and you're picking and choosing which groups you want to protect? Because, I mean, that's two groups. But what about other marginalized groups? I mean, if you want to go down the laundry list of marginalized groups, we can we can be here all day with that. And people because because I've already heard it. I heard it after the George Floyd protest and Breonna Taylor. Black people were wondering why come there wasn't an anti-black hate crime bill passed. It never got passed. I mean, black people, you could argue, are probably the most vocal minority in the political sphere. And so I think you would have, it would create a president for other groups that are going to feel like they don't get what they're getting, that their needs aren't being met either. But these people are being protected. That's what the one say something like that? is actually on my when my 100 day plan, I fully intend to bring the black activists and black leaders to the White House to meet with our top legislators to actually work on bills to get in Congress for reparations and anti hate speech. I'm actually working in Oregon right now to get a bill through the referendum process onto the ballot that will outlaw hate groups in Oregon, like the Proud Boys, the KKK, the Patriotic Front. They will not be able to have their offices here. They will not be able to have assets here. They will not be able to campaign here. They will be illegal in Oregon. And there's 24 other states I can do that in. People think that with genocide happening, it is against the indigenous people and the transgender people right now. Then there's the hate crimes against LGBTQ, the, the black community, the Mexican community, the razor wire at the border that Biden could absolutely be doing something about right now with Texas being an international border and border control being under the executive branch. He can get those razor wires dismantled and he's not. There's a lot of issues that, like you said, we could talk about all day. <laughs> and I do have policies that I'm going to be putting on my website for each and every single one of these issues. Because the wonderful thing about being president is I will be surrounded by a team of people who are specialists that can tackle more than one thing at a time. And it's going to be a lot of work. There's going to be a lot of Band-Aids being ripped off. And a lot of people who will claim identity politics won't like me. Those are the ones who are calling me a tyrant because I intend to hold people like Abbott and DeSantis responsible and accountable for what they have been doing. Um, but the marginalized communities that have been coming in, including my own, into my chats, into my live streams, onto my platform, volunteering with my with my team, we're, we are getting finally getting the left a singular message of no tolerance. We will have no tolerance for hate or bigotry and we will be safe. Yeah, I think I think you and I won't go too into this because I, I think we have differing interpretations of First Amendment. And um, because I, I, I guess around the time of the election last time, I actually deactivated my Facebook account because um, it was basically if you didn't fall in line with either team, like your stuff was either in shadow banned or it was lowered in the filters. And there was proof of this, like people would say, like, we can't see your post or anything. We don't see them at certain times of the day when you post it and they will refresh it. And when I, I guess the point I'm making is that if you're in a group period, there's always a danger of you being, I guess, suppressed or censored for whatever reason, regardless of how egregious the, the language is. And so I'm a free speech maximalist personally. Um, I don't think you can apply one thing to one group and not apply it to everybody. I think every, it has to be an open domain, but that may be too extreme, but that's just, um, that's kind of the way I, I wouldn't have this forum if I didn't invite certain types of people on. Now I have the discretion if someone is very openly like transphobic or homophobic or racist, I'm not going to have people like that on my forum, but, but at the same time, if someone's on my forum and I'm engaged with them and they have those views, it's like, 
okay, they have they, they also have phobic views, but it's like, what can I do about those views? Like, am am, am I going to just get them out of their system completely? I mean, they're still going to have those views regardless if if they're on my platform or not. And so I guess the question is, how do we assure that those people are weeded out, but other people aren't weeded out? Because they did that in 2019, I think, with Alex Jones and Farrakhan. They took all their stuff off of YouTube or whatever. And I said to myself, this is setting a dangerous precedent because, sure, you may not like Farrakhan or Alex Jones, but who else is this going to apply to? So for me, it is very black and white about um, hate speech is not protected under freedom of speech. And hate speech is very clear, uh, being openly homophobic, openly transphobic, actively taking away their rights, protesting at pagan events. Protesting is only covered when you're actually protesting government bodies, government decisions, government issues, not for private events, like protesting Planned Parenthood, protesting pagan events if you're a church. Those are not protected. That is actually borderline hate speech, if not hate speech, because you are directly targeting a group or an individual with your speech, or if it directly incites a crime. That is when they are no longer protected under free speech. And if we just get that line very clear, like if you are actively preventing someone else's freedoms because of what you are doing or what you are saying, that seems very clear to me. And I, I, want to say look into the paradox of tolerance and on my platform i i personally refuse to give people like moms of liberty a platform i refuse to give them a voice i refuse to let them spread their hate on my platform so they they are muted when i'm live if they come on there and start saying we'll come here illegally if we're talking about the people who are actively dying at the border they're muted immediately because i will not spread that rhetoric i will not spread that hate what is this group called? Um, it's my TikTok, my TikTok live. I no, no, I group that you're saying that that is trying to troll you and hate. Oh, there's quite a few. There's Moms of Liberty. There's a lot of very far right wing Republicans, and okay. even some Democrats come in and say things. And you know, they hear me not supporting Biden. They assume I'm I'm a Republican. Right. They hear me not supporting Trump. They assume I'm a Democrat. And they just start going in. And I'm like, no, guys, that's not going to happen here. We're not going to we're not going to attack people like a lot of the Democrats will try to attack Christians. But there's Christians on my platform. My running mate is a Christian. There's a difference between a Christian and the evangelical evangelical right that's actively stripping away our rights like access to health care, um, access to transgender health care, drag queen self-expression. There is a separation of church and state. So attacks come from both sides and it's not tolerated from both sides. Mm -hmm. At, you cut off just a little bit there um, towards the end, just so you know, like I, I don't take anything out like excerpts or anything like that. It just it was because the Internet connection was wasn't as stable. Oh no! Which part cut? Which part cut out? Right before at? you talked about um, the separation of church and state, like those two sentences leading up to that. Okay, I people, I'm I'm not attacking the religion itself of Christianity when I'm saying separation of church and state. A lot of Democrats feel I am attacking Christianity itself, and a lot of them who are for the separation of church and state jump on that bandwagon, and a Christian will come in and just be joining the conversation respectfully. And then out of nowhere, a Democrat in the chat will be like, we don't we don't accept your sky daddy here. And I'm like, we're not doing that. The only time we troll a Christian or a Republican or anything like that that comes in here is when they are pushing their beliefs on us, when they are speaking hateful. Otherwise, they are free to to say, hey, I'm going to pray for you. I hope you win the election or, or hey, I'm going to pray for you so you stay safe. I don't support your values, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for you so you stay safe. I'm like, I appreciate it. Thank you. I'll light a candle for you and we move on. You know, so the hate comes from both sides in different ways. Yeah, it does. Um, I would argue that a lot of this stuff that um, is still, to me, would be covered under free speech. I mean, that's just my interpretation of it. It's just 
regardless of it offending you in, in that way. Or, I mean, because you do have a lot of that kind of rhetoric going on. Um, but speaking of separation of church and state, that is like a, you put a strong emphasis on that in your campaign. Um, the last time we talked, we talked about it some, but for me, it's almost like, what's the difference between a gun lobby or a religious lobby or a pharmaceutical lobby? To me, it goes back to money being in politics. Again, it has nothing to do with religion because religious influence is there inevitably, obviously. But um, I'm, I don't know how much a percentage it is when it comes to, um, I don't know if you can pinpoint religion as the main influence on these politicians when you can go to Open Secrets and see where all these different lobbies are getting money from and sending it to the politicians. I just think religion is a small portion of all these different problems that we have in the lobbying atmosphere in Washington, D.C. Um, a lot of corporations are backed by these mega churches. They're, if not backed by, they work with. There's a lot of recordings of elected officials talking about their religious beliefs, especially when Roe Ro v. Wade was being overturned, saying, my God says abortion is a sin, and we're not going to do that. Oh, my goodness, these flies right now. They're trying to make me like Mike Pence, like I said before we were on. <laughs> make that joke for the viewers. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, God. So... When I just lost my train of thought, that's what was I saying? You were saying something about um, what were you talking about lobbies? Lobby, mm -hmm. Money. There's a lot of money in these churches, and the elected officials. There's recordings of them stating that because of my religious beliefs, I support this bill. And there's a difference between having your religious beliefs and having your own moral standard and forcing other people to follow that mm -hmm. through legislation. And so for me, that's what separation of church and state means. It means you, a, a religious organization will not be allowed to lobby for laws. And I don't think gun businesses, corporations, I don't think any corporation should be able to lobby for laws at all. I think Citizens United needs to be overturned. I wish the president had that power, but that's Congress. So get, mm -hmm. get on your Congress people if you want that overturned, if you want money out of politics get Congress to overturn Citizens United. I think, but see, I think that's ultimately the issue. And I don't I don't disagree with you that there needs to be a separation of church and state, but to me, it's already baked in the cake that the church is the state. And 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 I may be wrong with that, but I'm just I'm just basing it objectively on the way things are operating in the political world. Um it's clear that the church has an influence in politics, whether we want it to be or not. And it's clear that until the money is out of politics, things aren't going to change much with that. But I mean, APAC, American Israeli um, Political Affairs Committee, is a religious lobby, whether people like it or not. And I know that your favorite politician, and I'm talking to the audience, is probably um, being held at gunpoint by APAC. And so, and I'll probably be called anti-Semitic for saying something like that, but both parties are bought off by APAC. And that's the reason why Israel is very much, you don't talk about Israel or you don't get very far politically when it comes to traction. Um, it's not me making this stuff up. It's just following politics for a long time. And you have to tread very lightly when you talk about certain issues. And Israel is one of those things. You have to do things that are in the best interest of Israel in the United States, and if you do anything that suggests that you don't want to have anything to do with the Israel-U.S. bond and union, then you're completely out. And and it's proved by the numbers and the, the lobby money that comes in. So I, 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 unfortunately, until money's out of politics, the religious influence and everything else is still going to be a part of the corruption. I agree. It's one of those things where there's many issues that need to be tackled at once. Um, during my my presidency, I don't intend to fight with Congress to pass legislation or or not pass legislation. There is enough legislation in place in America to protect the American people and anyone on our on in America. It's just not being used. The presidents are not doing their job of running the country like they're supposed to. The legislative branch creates the legislation. The judicial branch um, clarifies and handles any disputes about the, the legislation and then the executive branch enforces that legislation and does foreign policy that's how it should be ran 
but you see the president trying to fight with Congress all the time instead of actually using the laws at their disposal. You see the Supreme Court, obviously, with special favors and personal gifts being very biased right now. And nothing is running the way it should. So we need to use the legislation in, in, in place right now to at least get the American people safe while the American people get people into office who can get rid of Citizens United and get that separation of church and state and make sure that all people are represented. And you actually brought up Israel, and I don't speak a lot about Israel or Palestine or anything over there that much or even Africa that much, because I feel like there's a lot of information that our government has in the classified files that I don't have access to. And I don't feel comfortable making a solid stance on how I would proceed with any of those countries without access to that information. Mm -hmm. I like informed decisions, not to just speak out loud about, yeah, this is what I'm going to do for that. And so I, I don't actually speak a lot about them on my platform outside of saying I need to gather all the intelligence information to make an informed decision on how to proceed. But human rights are absolutely going to be at the forefront of that. Of any decision made and hey i appreciate the honesty um it's just um it, it's one of those things where you just you see those patterns of um behavior and there has to be something to it um because all this and i made the comment earlier about us being so connected um the military industrial complex is very much connected with the world. Like we, our economies in the world are connected. It's not like we can, we can separate ourselves from people that we don't like necessarily. I mean, now all this anti-China rhetoric, I mean, it's ridiculous. You hear about China all the time, Russia all the time, Iran. And then you have this BRICS conference going on now in South Africa, which um, we're going to have a lot of commentators talking about the BRICS um, alliance, six more countries were added to the BRICS alliance. Amongst those countries, Argentina, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, um, Ethiopia. So you got a lot of stuff going on geopolitically that a lot of the politicians kind of sidestep because it doesn't fit into the whole idea of where well, everyone hates Russia, obviously. Yeah, people hate Russia so much. That's why over half the world wants to join the Russian, Brazilian, Indian Chinese alliance when it comes to like their economies and stuff. I mean, you can it's, it, you just can't separate one thing because Russia supplies the weed and the grain for the African continent. So those people aren't going to be like screw Russia because they have a relationship that we don't have with them. And so I think that the United States and other countries may do this too. But I'm very critical of my own country because the United States is very bad about condemning other countries for having relationships with other countries peacefully. And it's like, if we don't have the same sort of hegemony with it, it's like we automatically have this separation. And that's what bothers me about the whole idea of the allies, the alliances, all this stuff. To a certain degree, I understand the alliances, but there has to be some a shift in mentality to where we work with the world because if we don't have a, a shift in mentality where we work with the world cooperatively, we're just going to always be at war or we're going to always justify war with other people. I agree. Uh, my wife is actually Chinese. She was born in Wuhan, China. And oh, wow. yeah, yeah. So you imagine the racist remarks that she's gotten because of COVID and all of all. You don't have to like their government but there are people who live there that are good people. And whether you like it or not, the majority of goods you see in Walmart and any big box store come from China. There, we have products from India. We have products from these types of places, Mexico. And because people have problems with China, they have problems with Mexico, they have problems. And we, we're still working with those countries. We're still getting goods from those countries. I actually think the embargo on Cuba needs to be lifted completely. Oh, 100%, yeah. <laughs> and somebody actually had a dream. Uh, this is going to be a little stretch, but somebody had a dream of, about uh, the deity, different deities were meeting in like a conference style room. 
And they were speaking about me and my campaign and saying, if Brittany is elected, then there's going to be a ripple effect of balance coming to the entire world. And they told me about this dream in an email. I'm like, that's a really heavy dream, but that'd be pretty fantastic if we could get some <laughs> kind of balance because I'm honestly tired of people dying. Mm-hmm. I'm tired of people dying, of starving children, of of STDs and STIs and diseases spreading because there's no health care, of cancer, of of all these things that we could be actively working to fix with the technology that we have today, but we're so concerned about stealing resources from here or or talking bad about these people that we're not working for the people. I had a question because I knew I know we haven't talked a lot about healthcare um, in particular. I, I know the last episode we talked about homelessness some towards the end, and I loved your response to that. Um, as far as the government is concerned, like how do you view government? What is the government's purpose when it comes to the people? And if this is even applicable, are there any institutions that we seriously need to consider getting rid of in the government? Or how, how do you see government just as a whole? Well, uh, restructuring is definitely needed. I feel like one, there should have never been parties. George Washington said there shouldn't have been parties. I believe we did. We may have discussed that in our first interview. Mm-hmm. Um, it's destroying our country. The government is supposed to work for the people. The legislation that's passed is supposed to protect the people and provide for the people. The taxes that are paid are supposed to pay for roads, schools, for the country so we can have a nice economy, nice lifestyle. The people are taken care of. And then there's, of course, there's foreign relations, but the government's supposed to take care of the people and work for the people, not above and separate. And that's what we're seeing a lot of right now. And Congress, I feel, has a lot of power. We need to restructure how the power system has worked in between the three branches of government. The Supreme Court, there's not really any accountability there. Congress isn't going to impeach any of the sitting justices. Congress members are not going to impeach themselves. There's no way for for the executive branch or the 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 Supreme Court could remove a Congress member, but they've never actually went that far. They've never tested that power. They're there's too much imbalance. I feel like the financial aspect, which is controlled by Congress, needs to be put into the executive branch and controlled by the cabinet. The cabinet is who oversees how the educa- education, healthcare, our, our transportation, our national forests. They are the ones that oversee it. They should be the ones deciding how the budget is allocated for the people, not Congress, who doesn't. Congress's sole job should be passing legislation and removing legislation and protecting the people. They, they currently they have the power to remove a president. They have the power to remove a Supreme Court justice. They have the power to remove themselves. They have the power to pass and repeal laws. They have the power to control the budget. They have the power to decide if we go to war or not. I mean, checks and balances are also very important, but there's not enough checks and balances in place. And Congress has consolidated way too much power. There needs to be a restructuring. Some people even think that we should be able to get rid of Congress and just have the executive branch and the judicial branch working on legislation and I'm not sure how that would look, I'm, but it's what's been it's what's been being said in a lot of different places. I personally, I've never understood the point of the Senate. Personally, I think that the Senate is a roadblock, and um, it's like if you have 435 representatives, what's the point of having 100 senators, two in each state representing? It, it, to me, the Senate keeps a lot of things that are proposed. It just kills the bills. And I'm all about free flowing, like, let's get this stuff done already, because so many people are dying and a lot of people are dying because of incrementalist policies. Um, homelessness is an urgent is an urgent crisis. It's, it's, a, it's something that needs to happen now. Healthcare is a right. As far as I'm concerned, we need to be dealing with that stuff now. But as long as we have this sort of collaborating um, lawmaking sort of like back and forth all the time. It's like nothing's ever going to be urgent enough for the people. So um, is there anything that a president can actually do to, um, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, expedite matters to where it does benefit a broader group of people like immediately? 
that is where executive orders come in, but it's very limited. With executive orders, the president can expand and clarify laws, uh, but the president can't create new laws. The president can't control corporations. The president can't do anything, anything like that. So for example, I could do an executive order to, for the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. For me, forcing a person to be pregnant could put their life in danger. It's taking away their right to life. So I could do an executive order providing reproductive health care to everyone at a federal level, but it would only be in place while I'm president because the it, it's not codified into law. It's a temporary band-aid, a temporary fix, unless Congress actually gets those protections in or the following president can get it in without overturning that executive order. But honestly, the outside of running the country, the president cannot put new legislation. They could, I could draft up legislation and go to go to a congressperson, uh, a representative, and be like, "Hey, would you sponsor this bill for me?" And they could say no and walk away, and my bill could never see the floor. Or they could sponsor it, and then everyone else just makes it dead in the water and doesn't let it go ahead. The the president really has very little control over the legislative process. Mm hmm. Now. Regarding, um, I'm looking at your site where it says government transparency and accountability policy. Um, point number five says improving whistleblower protections to encourage government employees to report misconduct without fear of retaliation. Well, we have lots of political prisoners um, currently. I, I know probably the largest um, name amongst this cohort is Julian Assange, um, Mumia Abu Jamal. Uh, Leonard Pethier, there's lots of different people that are caught up in the system, but Julian in particular um, sticks out because, I mean, I've had several of his um, um, advocates on, you know, to, to get him out of um, the Belmarsh um, prison that he's in right now, the Belmarsh High Security Prison in the UK. Um, even though he's an Australian citizen, um, he could be charged up to 175 years in prison for um, breaking the Espionage Act of 1917. Um, if people don't know, Julian Assange was, he's the founder of WikiLeaks and he's responsible for uncovering some of the most heinous war crimes. Um, one in particular was a Apache helicopter shooting where um, civilians were killed on camera, journalists were killed on camera. And so he documented all these different occurrences. He's also responsible for the DNC the 2016 election, so a lot of people are pinning blame uh, on him for for us having Trump in the first place without acknowledging what he was pulling up was like, okay, these emails were sent and this stuff was said, and he's basically in prison now for being a journalist telling the truth. Would you have that power to um, release those people out of prison, even though he's under the UK jurisdiction, they're trying to extradite him here, to the states, but would you have control as the president to basically pardon him? That's something I'm honestly not sure about. I know jurisdiction over, over citizens of other countries, if they're locked up in a different country, I, I could negotiate and push for, but as far as forcing anything, I don't think that's possible. Um, but in, in say in the United States, oh God, what's Leonard? No, his name just left me, the indigenous man that was- Leonard Peltier. Yeah, okay, so I was, he, I could pardon and get out of prison. I could I could get him out of prison. Because he's here. Yes, because he's here in, so in America. So if Julian gets extradited, you would tend to be able to, to pardon him too. Possibly, yeah, we, we just have to see how how it works. Where, where would he be extradited to, to the United States, to- They're trying you know, to. Yeah. Yeah. So we just have to wait and see how that goes. And and that's part of the thing. It's actually illegal internationally to interfere in another country's political structure and how they handle things. That's why we couldn't force someone to send someone back to America or to another place. That's why when American citizens are hostage, we have to negotiate. We mm -hmm. can't just give them back to us follow the law we it's it's a very touchy subject 
with a lot of nuances and red tape that would have to get through with other countries being involved. Mm -hmm. But this is also important because um, I've said in um, episode, I forget which one it was, it was the one with my friend Tyler King is actually a personal family friend. And um, he came on really just like, he doesn't have like this um, knowledge of a certain area. He just came on because he just wanted to learn how politics work in the United States. And we talked a lot about it. And um, what this proves is that the, the president has a lot of limitations. Um, it's one office. I think we emphasize the president way too much. Um, and it's a, it's one of the big flaws in that system, I think. Um, it's just uh, we've redirected all the conversation to every four years. But we never talk about the local assemblies. We never talk about the two-year cycles. It's always the, the four-year political show every single time um, between the elephants and whatever the other animal is. I don't even, I don't even keep up with them anymore. But it's just um, what you're saying means a lot because it shows that you, you have lots of limits yourself. And a lot of times you're probably battling people within the system itself even though you're the head of state. Yep, I'm actually, I'm trying to educate people on that because you know people are mad at Biden for gas prices, they're mad at um, tr Trump for inflation, they're mad at, the president does not control any of those aspects. The president does not control gas prices. Yeah, Biden could release old boils of oil, bo barrels of oil, which he did. It did not really affect the gas prices. They dropped a little bit, but that's because there was more supply for the demand. It's a supply and demand system that the president doesn't have control over. The president cannot tell corporations how much money to charge for the oil that they get. The president cannot do that. The president can enforce treaties. The president can make sure that states at a state level are, are protecting their state citizens' rights at a federal level. So if one citizen has these rights here, this citizen over here also gets those federal rights. It's it's a, I honestly, I don't, it's not as big of his office as people make it out to be. Mm -hmm. There's three branches of our government. All three of those branches need to be held accountable. All three of those branches have a job. We, we almost look at the president as a king or a queen, as a monarch, even though we don't like the monarchy. We, we look at it as if the president has unilater unilateral power and they don't, they do not have unilateral power. They have their specific job outlined in the constitution and currently in recent history, they have been failing at that job. Mm -hmm. You made a comment earlier about the cabinet that kind of scared me, honestly. You said something about the transfer of power from Congress to the cabinet. What do you mean by that exactly? Just for the funding, for the funding. just for funding, because the the Secretary of Education they oversee how funding is allocated within the education sector, making sure public schools get what they need, making sure That's that disability important. specialists are there. The the Secretary of Health and Human Services, same thing for doctors, offices, disability, all of that stuff. Secretary of Interior for the federal lands, they need their money allocated for that. Right now, all of them have to go to Congress and say, this is what we need. Actually, the president drafts a budget based off their needs and goes to Congress and hopes that Congress approves it. Mm -hmm. The cabinet should be able to look, should have that control over the funding because the cabinet knows what they need to run the institutions the way they should be ran. Congress is a limitation on that. It's it's a limitation on, on the funding and we're, our public schools are suffering, our hospitals are suffering, they can't, our roads are dilapidated in, in smaller areas. We don't have a train system where we can actually travel for cheaper between cities and towns. And that could even boost our economy. Nationalizing and expanding our rail system, if we had the funding to do that, Congress would have to approve it again. But it would create millions of jobs. It would boost our economy. It would give people from small towns access to jobs in larger cities. But it's all hanging on Congress. Mm -hmm. The cabinet of the executive branch should be able to have control of the finances, considering the fact that cabinet is the one who uses the finances and runs these institutions under the direction of the president and the other positions. I guess I guess if I was at the mercy of a, of a Jones administration, I would be more confident hearing that. <laughs> but 
the people that I know in the cabin now scare the hell out of me. So yeah. I would be afraid of those people having control of any of this. That that's what scares me. And I think it's just the danger when it becomes so, so concentrated to where the cabinet's responsible for like and I think it kind of goes into the Supreme Court. Um we talked about this some. I mean, you only have like nine justices, right? But these nine people are responsible for enforcing like federal law. To that's what scares me is there's so much power in such a few hands of people. Um, th that always scares me about when the government, the way it's structured right now. There's, there's, there needs to be more of um, a collaboration between the people. Like we don't, I don't feel like the people have any influence in the government. Sure, they say that we elect the officials, but there seems like once that happens, once we put them in, that's it. It kind of just like they just take it from there, and they represent themselves or their interests or whatever, and we just sort of left behind. And this is why I like conversations like this because we're speaking about the cabinet having having control of the finances, correct? And then you bring up the fact that the people are not heard. Instead of Congress approving the budget, the cabinet could put together a budget that they feel is needed for there and put it to a vote through the ballot system and the American people would have their voices heard. Well, that would be a really good idea. That would be a checks and balance. And conversations like this are how those ideas come about. Because I had, I was actually, I've been thinking about that in my brain. Like, would the president approve it? Would the Supreme Court approve it? How would that work if that shifted? The American people, it's their money anyways. They should get be the ones who approve it. Mm. That's a, that's a good way to look at. It. I wish it was set up like that, honestly. <laughs> and who knows? Maybe these conversations will, um, you know, ultimately result in some more um, tangible action. Because it just it, it seems like that there's things that can be done right away. And I'm all about getting things done then, you know. And if if people want to use that argument, can you just correct it? You know, if you figure out that that decision was too um, abrupt, you can just redirect it. It doesn't have to be, but that's, I just think it's an excuse to not have any action, no accountability. And it seems like that's the way the system is used now to basically just keep things the way they are and just, you know, leave it to someone else to have to deal with it. Who cares? Just leave it to that person to have to deal with it. But what I the have, what's that? One thing the president can do is actually um, do an executive order to make independent task force to investigate um, these different bodies and different institutions. We could do a task force to investigate the contracts with private prisons, a task force to investigate the different hospitals and the different um, districts. There's a lot of things the president can do with the cabinet mm -hmm. um, and even Congress. The president can in initiate a task force to do an investigation for crimes against humanity, say against Abbott or DeSantis. But, of course, they're in the cor pockets of the same corporation, so they're not willing to step on those toes. They don't have a backbone. They're not willing to put up that fight. Okay. We have about 25 minutes, if that's okay with you, about a half hour left. Does it work for you? Yeah, however however long. <laughs> I okay. go live four or five hours at a time. We could... <laughs> yeah, we'll go about another half hour and then I'll get off immediately because I got to go get my son and daughter from school. But um, it's, it's been great and we we still got a half hour to talk and um, I'm sure we'll talk afterwards as well. But I wanted to make a statement or series of statements and kind of get your response to the statements. It kind of touches the military industrial complex that we talked about earlier, but I want to get this stuff out just so the people have it. And then I want to transition and get your views on you. You have a second amendment, amendment platform and you talk about guns, responsible gun ownership and stuff. So I want to get a few views on that and then also immigration. But um, according to the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, it says that um, today America's $858 billion war budget is at one of the highest levels since World War II when the 20 year and $2 trillion war in Afghanistan ended. Pentagon in spending went up. The fifth spending is now higher than during the peak of the Cold War or the heights of the Vietnam or Korean War. America spends more than twice as much as China on its military forces. America spends more on war than the next nine countries combined. And keep in mind in 2019, out of the top 10 government 
contractors, when it comes to funds, nine of 10 of those are military contracting companies that include Lockheed, Raytheon, United Technologies, General Dynamics, Lados, Northrop, Grumman, just it's crazy. The only one that wasn't there was a pharmaceutical, McKesson Corporation. So everything seems to be tied to the military. And so, and that's why I tried to, not in a, um, a hardcore, like uh, adversarial way, but I try to make everyone, whether whatever side they're on, sort of realize that, can we at least agree on this issue that this is a delivery issue to um, justify just spending more money um, on war because as John Stasevich said, when I interviewed him a couple of months ago, he said that the, the military is so embedded in our society that we have to justify it to keep our economy afloat because everything is so tied into the stock market and all these companies are publicly traded. So there's an incentive to kill people. There's an incentive to keep wars continuing. Even if we're not there physically, there's an incentive to keep the missile contractors um, pockets lined up to keep those people employed and everything else. And I just think it's a, a problem that neither party seems to be willing to touch. It's almost like the Israel debate. Again, it's, it's a topic that you cannot, as soon as you start talking about it, people go after you. Even Trump, he didn't start any new wars technically. I mean, he droned and bombed the hell out of people. But he didn't technically start any new wars. And I believe people were upset. The deep state was upset with him because of that, because he wasn't war hawkish enough. And I noticed that, too, with American politics, that everything seems to be at the mercy of the military complex. I actually um, agree with you. There's a lot of service members, too, who want to move away from contractors. The contractors do subpar work on bases. They don't they don't. They're, they're not like the construction contractors, the defense contractors, they're not that great because it needs to be back in the hands of the actual enlisted members for their jobs that they're trained to do. We could build our own bases. We could, we could do all of that stuff ourselves. But that's one thing I won't shy away from is the reason why they want wars, like you said it yourself, it brings money. War is profitable. And what do our government what our officials like our corporations like they like money so of course they want to keep it going and we we do need to move away from that the and the pentagon i believe has lost over seven trillion lost over seven trillion dollars and failed multiple audits that seven trillion dollars could fund universal health care and free education mm -hmm. why do they need it if they can't keep track of it and see i was talking to i'm not going to mention the name Okay, I'll mention the name because this person is actually running for office too for president. Mike Chermod is a libertarian running for president. And I've interviewed Mike and I have another interview with Mike. But I pressed Mike on this issue because he's a libertarian. I identify as a libertarian too, but I view myself as a libertarian socialist. So we have lots of divergences within libertarianism. But I've always told my audience that these I've had to learn these terminologies over the years because libertarian means a lot of different things to people. I mean libertarian in the sense that you should be you should be free to take whatever drugs you want. You should be able to have as much sex as you want. You should be able to um, de determine what's in in and out of your body, like, like body autonomy, like sexual autonomy. In that sense, libertarian and and most libertarians should agree with those things, but they don't because they tend to be the more conservative libertarians. So I like to make that distinction, but I was pressing him and saying, we can argue about socialism and all this other stuff um, until we get this other stuff under control, the spending under control. And so everyone tends to agree that the spending is out of control and we don't need to be spending this kind of money on the military for the reasons that you mentioned. We could, we could have healthcare for everybody. That could be a very realistic thing um, while we're arguing about an N95 mask during a pandemic when we should already have health care. And it, to me, it's just a way to just sidestep the issues because you don't want to address the elephant in the room and, and we don't all have health care. But everyone in the Congress does. The same people who are fighting against um, the socialized health care is such a demon, you know, socialized health care is so evil. But yet they all have socialized health care in Congress. 
and we're not supposed to want to be fighting for that. It seems like they're doing pretty well for themselves. They can fall down a flight of stairs every six months, and they get covered easily. And elected officials don't lose things like Social Security benefits. Biden, despite making over 400000 a year on presidential salary, is still collecting his, his Social Security. Mm. And, but as an American working class citizen, if, you, if you're working and you work too much, you lose your, your benefits. And see, and these these are very like relatable topics. Like these things right here are like actually affecting us. Like this is something you can see, and we don't have to get involved in all these ideological like divergences and differences. And and, and because that's what they want personally. I honestly believe that if they keep the conversation in the culture war like realm. That's exactly what they want. They don't want to talk about issues that are affecting us, like the basic like needs. And 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 that's what is the frustrating thing. I've seen some of the people that I looked up to in politics, they all just follow this line now of just like not account being accountable for anything because they can't be for the reason you said before, because they have to do what their party tells them to do. They can't do it. They can't break away from the party stance because they're just going to be a pariah or put by themselves in time out. So they basically have to do what everyone else tells them to do in the party. Exactly, exactly. And there's actually, I'm not going to name names right now because she hasn't officially done it. But um, when I was in Iowa, there's an elected official there who was a speaker at the rally as well. Excuse me. Uh, she was a speaker at the rally as well, and um, she's a state representative at the, yeah, I'm not going to say names, but she told the another candidate that was there that actually is the reason why I was there to speak, that hearing me speak for three minutes got her more motivated than Biden's entire term, and that she's actually considering breaking party lines to endorse me. She's very hesitant to do so because she is a newly elected representative. She doesn't have her her backing yet. You know, a lot of she still butts heads with a lot of people in the legislature. But the fact that I have a, a Democrat elected official like just meeting me and saying, I already want to break party lines to to endorse you. And then also in Oregon, I've been working with Ibrahim. He's the human rights chair, chair president of the Human Rights Committee in Eugene. And he's also the chairperson of the Cape PAC in Eugene. He's invited me to get interviewed by the PAC. Um, he invited me to the Democratic Party of Oregon convention this last weekend, which was a very interesting event to go to. And then there's also Paula, who is part of the SEIU. She's the co-chair for the Treasury, co-chair for the Indigenous People Caucus, co-chair for the Women of Color Caucus. And she's a Republican. And she's starting to work with me. And that's showing that I can work across party lines. It's showing that I can work with people from more than one party and, and listen to their views and come to common ground and fight for the same things. And that's fighting for the people. Mm -hmm. So bipartisan support would be fantastic. I'm still hoping for it. It hasn't happened since 1889 with Grover Cleveland, where both Democrats and Republicans backed a presidential candidate for the full like i mean like officials back democrat and republican officials back a candidate and he won with bipartisan support do and you, that's needed do you feel that you could um i mean i know the answer to this question but what would be your appeal to um libertarians greens socialists i mean you have different groups of people who are basically sort of um it's assumed that they aren't relevant enough to have like a following but there are lots of um these groups but i feel like it's because again we've been kind of embedded with the two-party system in our psyche but what would be your appeal to um various groups uh for instance a lot of the stuff you're talking about it sounds like you're environmentally conscious it seems like you could get easily get Green Party endorsements. You could get Libertarian Party endorsements when it comes to, you know, issues around, you know, freedom, autonomy. You have a lot of that um, verbiage on your site. Like, what would you say to those people? I actually, um, I have 
many different people come in in my lives on TikTok. If anybody wants to to talk to me in real time too, you're more than welcome to join on TikTok on lives. Um, they come in. They when we when we talk about freedom and body autonomy and and our rights as people, less government in some aspects, more government on the federal level. Let I. The states are meddling too much, in my opinion, but we, I, I support the COVID vaccine, right? If you want to get the vaccine, go get it. But I don't support mandates for vaccines because that's forcing someone to put something in their body. That's good. I to support, know. <laughs> yeah. I support the full legalization and regulation of drugs. People hear legalization and they think decriminalization. They don't hear the regulation part. Drugs were decriminalized in Oregon and it's been a disaster. We need regulation. That's where the government oversight comes in. Um, other countries have done it where they've legalized and regulated drugs and it's reduced overdose deaths. It's reduced addiction rates. It's cleaned up the streets. And if we act, people have problems with the drug cartels from Mexico, not thinking that fentanyl was flown in from India and China by sometimes our government officials, people working in police stations, flying it to the those stations. But it would take America off of the black market for drugs. The cartels would no longer have business here it, because it would be legalized. And then if any tax revenue comes from it, that could also fund universal health care. I'm also for legalization of prostitution, which we spoke about last time. Mm -hmm. It's an adult's right to choose what they do with their body. And that would also be another tax revenue that could fund education. Mm -hmm. So there's different aspects. I think it's a balancing act. I also, you know, I'm a business owner. I, <laughs> I own my college. I would prefer to be able to run that the way that I see fit. But I also think that college should be free. So you should have a choice between paying for a private specialized college or going to a free private, co I mean, a free public college. Mm -hmm. Just like in elementary school, you can, you can go to a public school for free. But then if you want to go to a specialized like nature school or religious school, you pay for it. Mm -hmm. It should be like that on the college level, too. And for environmental issues, I'm absolutely following indigenous lead. I actually have someone in mind that I think he said yes, <laughs> that I'm going to nominate for the secretary of interior. He's an indigenous man. He has um, connections to tribal authorities. He I mean, leadership. He has. Um, connections to the water protectors and and the environmental activists within the nations and I think someone like that would be he's a boots on ground person which we definitely need more boots on ground people in our elected offices they stay in their cushy offices not actually getting out there with the people getting their hands dirty working and so my cabinet is going to be built up from people that are from our lived experience mm -hmm. and yeah. he's one of them I love I loved a lot of that because it's kind of like I knew where you stood on those issues just based on our conversations, but that's good to kind of get the disclosure. Um, and um, we'll probably come back to some of those issues like more into detail at a later time. We're running a little short on time now, but we got, like I said, we'll go about another 10, 15 minutes or so. But I did want to ask you a little bit about your Second Amendment policy. Um, you have, again, you don't have a ton of like um, detailed policies on your site, but for someone who's more politically inclined, they would kind of get an understanding, I think, from it. But like you said, you have a lot of emphasis on your TikTok channel and you do a lot of live streams, like educating the public. So um, I'll link definitely all the information to the episode description so people can find you um, on here. But you talk about Second Amendment policy, psychiatric evaluations, weapons safety courses, which I think is great, background checks, reducing gun violence. Um, I guess points three and four and, and point five, protection, protecting Second Amendment rights. Um, and you have it highlighted there, you know, where it is not to be infringed upon. I think that's understood by the audience. But I'm curious about the background checks aspect and reducing the gun violence. Uh, just based on some of the information I've been researching, the Department of Justice, I think in 2019, did some statistics. And it was kind of what I was thinking before. Wouldn't the black market, wouldn't people find a way to get guns in the black market, regardless of all these measures? There will be preventative measures put in place to kind of reduce like um, people dying from guns 
which is really high. I think I think it's like over forty five thousand people a year die from firearms. Um, so it's a bad number. But I'm just curious about that because forty three percent um of guns are, are obtained through the black market and also of six percent through theft, ten percent through retail purchase, less than one percent from gun shows, and another eleven percent people get it from um they get a gun from they let someone else get the gun for them, like a criminal, for instance. And then you have 15 percent of the cases where the gun's actually from a friend, a friend or a relative. So it seems like people are already finding ways to get around this system. So but you're saying, like, let's just surveil all the guns. Like, but how do we do that when we have so many guns on the black market? So part part of the plan, it's. If any one of these are institutionalized by themselves, it could be very easily circumvented. But say we have universal background checks for private gun sales. If you sell, if I sold a gun to my sister, there would still have to be a background check. Um, that in conjunction with, with safety classes, conceal and carry classes are not enough. They're, they're bare minimum. P there's conceal and carry purses out there. And I'm gonna tell anyone out there right now, if you take a conceal and carry class, a purse, whether it's designed to carry a gun or not, is one of the least secure places you can have your gun. If you are going like that, we need in-depth safety classes, how to carry your gun if you're going to take it out, if you're going to have a concealed carry, how to strap it to your body appropriately, how to store it appropriately in your home. And because I have, I have a gun myself, I want to get another one. I don't want to restrict the types of gun people can own. You can own a tank and a rocket launcher. You just have to go through extra steps. You don't see anybody complaining about the extra steps you have to go through to own a military grade weapon. You extra permits, extra yeah, extra oh permits. Oh my gosh, it's scary. There's entire groups out there that they have meetups like once a year to fire off all these weapons and and mm -hmm. rocket launchers and grenade launchers. You can own them already in America. But there's regulations. There's there's regulations on how you get them, and nobody is complaining about that. Nobody is. But you don't see somebody using a rocket launcher at a grade school because of those regulations, because of the legalities surrounding it, mm -hmm. and so it's like a graded type of ownership. And if you properly teach people how to store their guns, don't leave it in your car. Strap it to your body. Um, the theft the theft rate would would go down. Um, children getting their guns from their parents. Parents get too complacent and they leave their guns out. Mm -hmm. Children have access. Lock your guns up, take the courses. And then the psychiatric evaluations as well. Um, they would be, I think the psychiatric evaluations would have to be free. And with the mental health of America, it would open doors to counseling. Say you go and you get evaluated and you're told, you know, you're, you're suffering from, it seems like you're suffering from depression right now. We'd want to see you again in a couple months to see how you're doing. Get some services, get some help. And it would open that door. And if somebody feels like they're being in, in discriminated against, then there could be an oversight body where they could submit, hey, I, I complain. I feel like I want to be reevaluated by a different provider to see, you know, where I want this looked into. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be a violation of HIPAA because if you go to buy a gun and it said all it would be is, is on your because they do background checks. Right. So if they do a background check and on that background check, it said, yes, you've completed the the necessary medical appointments. and these steps would also deter people. Like if my friend wanted me to buy them a gun and I had to go sit through a class, go get psychiatrically evaluated, get a background check, every, not every single time, but once every you know six months, once every year, I wouldn't want to do that for someone else. That's way too much work. That's, that's too much work just to get someone else a gun. And of course, you know, there's going to be that we have 3D printed guns now, ghost guns, and that definitely needs to be cracked down on. That's probably still going to be an issue, but you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't heard of any school shooting being done by a ghost gun. Mm. I haven't seen that. It's always by a gun gotten by their parent or legally obtained because there wasn't a psychiatric evaluation when if somebody like, like, um, oh, Sandy Hook, if he had had an evaluation before buying his guns, he most likely would have had those guns. If my son's father had an evaluation before buying his guns with his schizophrenia and his PTSD from being deployed, he wouldn't have killed himself and his then recently ex-girlfriend in a psychosis episode because mm -hmm. he wouldn't have had a gun that he legally bought. Mm -hmm. It's not just yeah. mass shootings. It's at every level.
gun violence and mental health goes hand in hand in America. And there's such a huge stigma against mental health that you're you're not um, you're not macho if you go to therapy. You're less of a man. Mm-hmm. And also how hard it is to find a provider, especially for children, mm-hmm. that if we can tackle those issues, then we will see less violence. Will it be gone completely? I don't think in, in the human psych, we can get rid of violence completely in any form, but it can be greatly reduced. We can make our children safer in schools. Like I'm terrified to send them back to school. Mm-hmm. But, and as much as I, I have my guns, I like to go out and shoot, shoot them at the ranges or in the woods. I'm willing to do those steps. I'm willing to do that. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's too much to ask when children are literally dying. Yes, I, I think it's one of those things where it, it takes a transformation. I know for the longest I had a negative view of guns. But again, I was operating under a different mindset and I was surrounded by all the people in my blue, in my blue army, you know, everyone's in the blue army. Everyone was, I guess you could almost say anti-gun at at a certain degree. I was like very, I had a very negative view of guns, but um, it could have also been because of just, um, and my neighborhood wasn't completely rampant, crazy, but I mean, we did have some gun violence like early nineties. But it wasn't as bad as some areas in the country. But I think about that aspect of it, too. I feel like the documented mass shootings, they make the news. But the everyday like shootings in the trailer parks, in the Black communities, those aren't documented the same way. And, and if they are documented on the local news, they're almost ridiculed. Like, oh, that's just such a normal part of their existence but they don't address the poverty aspect of it. They don't address how these people are being left behind. And I, I think gun violence has a lot of different um, origins. And But I think the way they simplify it like that, it, I think there's a common cause. I think poverty is a lot of this common cause and, and it does create a whole set of mental illness um, issues alongside the poverty because um, are people really, analyzing um, those already marked negative, um, those people who can't ever amount to anything in life, those people who have already been typecasted, those people aren't viewed in the same way as far as a mental evaluation as someone who goes up and shoots up a school that comes from a suburb or whatever. I I think that's the most perturbing aspect of it is just the, the levels of um, the way people decide when gun control is important versus when it's not important. And you see that, um, I feel like some of that, not just poverty, but institutionalized racism. Um, if you look in where where the form, like people try to say, what about gang violence, mass shooting by gangs? Uh, I don't think they've researched where gangs actually came from. Gangs came as a result of a discriminatory police force that was built up from racist groups like the KKK after the slave the slavery was was illegalized and they had to make these groups to protect their neighborhoods and poverty came into play and they kind of morphed into this other aspect that they are today but if we can tackle institu- institutionalized racism the poverty aspect of america and the mental health of america then we could actually stand a chance of of reducing hopefully ending but reducing gun violence on not just for school shootings but at a scale in our cities, in our trailer parks, in our in our apartment complexes. And something that we may have touched on before, I don't think we've explicitly talked about the war on drugs, but you talked about, um, you made an interesting distinction. I didn't even know anything about it. I just assumed in Oregon that all the drugs were legalized, but you said that they're decriminalized. Can you give the viewers, where, what's the difference between decriminalization and legalization and what would it mean if Oregon legalized the drugs as opposed to decriminalizing them? So with it being decriminalized, you can still get in trouble for having drugs. You can't go to authorities for help. Um, If you're overdosing, you can still be cited for having drugs. You can still be fined. You can still be, um, if it's after a certain amount of times, you can still be put in jail. There's no protections for people who are on drugs. If if you're being um, trafficked, 
and you're being forced to sell drugs, you don't have protections. You just now are not going to be targeted because you have drugs on you, pretty much. The legalization aspect puts protections in place. It puts the, the regulation, which is what's important, because when you deregulate it, it can just, we have fentanyl going crazy. We have uh, people shooting up and leaving needles on the side of the street where children are. And if you legalize and regulate it, you wouldn't have that because there'd be areas they could go to safely use it. There would be um, places they could go to, I get, I hate saying this, it feels wrong saying it, right? But buy clean drugs where fentanyl is not lacing into, not laced into the Coke and they're not using these dusty materials to create these drugs. It'd be, they'd be made in sterile environments. So overdose deaths rates, cross-contamination, all of that stuff would be reduced. Of course, we still have the issue of children trying to buy drugs. It would still obviously be illegal, just like it is for cigarettes or beer um, for anyone under 18 or 21. I really think 21 should be the age, but um, actually, no, I'm going to take that back. <laughs> for drinking, I think if you can serve the military at 18 and put your life on the line, you should be able to go to a bar and buy a damn beer. It was 18, I think, for... For a while, it was. But I also feel like you also shouldn't be able to join the military till you're about 21. Because oh. if I had, <laughs> if I was, if I had waited till I was older, my service probably would have went a lot different because I would have known who I am better. I would have been more confident in myself. But that's probably why they want young children because the whole point of basic training is to break them down to nothing and build them into the perfect soldier. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's regulation is the key aspect of legalization. You don't have regulation with decriminalization and regulation also opens doors to study, to, to research that's, that's legal. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a difference. It, I think it's a big difference. Some people may not, but I think it's a big enough difference that had it been done differently in Oregon, Oregon would look different right now. And I agree with that. Um, and audience, I hate to end this because I have places to go. I know Brittany probably does too. She's probably got more time than I do today. But um, I definitely want you back for a third interview. I know originally I had talked about a presidential forum, but I talked about it to myself and just some other people that are close to me. And a lot of people, honestly, just based on the feedback, said that they like the way that the interviews are going the way they are, just they're more intimate. They can get more of an uh, of a picture. They can have a more of a mental picture of the candidate, and they can kind of develop a profile better having these one on one interviews as opposed to having six or seven people at once having to deal with internet not working the way it's intended to work. So um, I think this has been great, and the platform is growing, and um, hopefully everyone that I interviewed their platforms continue to grow as well too. But I just want to ask you, are there any final words you have for my audience before we uh, go today? Uh, the typical fundraising aspect. I'm not backed by corporations. Um, I was number 24 and the top unaffiliated earner in, in the second quarter. I am now number 34 because I'm not backed by parties or PACs. And there is one unaffiliated person ahead of me now. <laughs> So money speaks in politics. Any dollar counts. There is a link on my bio right in the corner. You could donate even just a dollar helps. There's also merchandise on my website. Um, I also am an author. My book's not up there, but it's linked in the link tree in my bio on, on my TikTok. And I need to get it on my website. Getting into a top seller position on Amazon. Any funding comes to me, goes directly to my campaign. And all of it helps. Also, my birthday's on the 31st. So a birthday donation would be fantastic. What's the name of your book called? Alanis. It's Al Alanis Transported. It's a dark fantasy. It's a mini book. I'm working on number two right now. How do you but, spell it? Uh, A-L-A-U-N-U-S. And then that's transported. Okay, Alanis. A-L-A-U-N-U-S. <laughs> yep. Okay. No, that's, that's important. So if I find a link, I'll just link all that into the description as well. And you say you're working on a second book? Yeah, the number number two, because it's a mini book. Um, if I was going to write the whole book by itself, I would not be able to sit down long enough to focus on it. Okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I do. I'm doing it in segments. And then once all five of the mini books are done, the mini books will no longer be available. It'll just be one solid book. And then there's going to be three solid books total. 
once it's all done. It's going to be a trilogy. Dark fantasy, trigger warning. It's not a romance. It's <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Miss Brittany Jones, we appreciate you here at Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. This is a great episode 52. Uh, a lot of my listeners and um, people, subscribers obviously get my content, but a lot of people don't subscribe to the channel, but they're watching a lot of the content. Like I can tell that. So I um, urge everyone interested friends and family to subscribe to Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. Um, I want to start doing that for each episode because this is really a public forum. I don't really accept money for, for anything. And um, I don't anticipate growing at that kind of a rate anyway. If I did, I'd be kind of scared, honestly. I'm glad the position that we're in right now. Um, I want to grow slowly because um, I don't want to be an overnight sensation type thing because those things don't tend to work out the way they're intended to work out. I just want it to be more organic. Um, money's not an incentive on the forum. Information and ideas are the incentive. And so, and hopefully building a community of um, tolerance, acceptance, and um, coexistence. That's really what we want to um, preach here at the forum and just building that international community because we are people at the end of the day and we need to kind of look at each other more as, um, you know, working together in this complex world as opposed to finding ways to you know, use your difference as a reason not to communicate, which, which is very common um, tendency. But we got to kind of open our minds up and be free thinkers, because remember, you can't unthink free thought. And I had to throw that slogan in. That's like an unofficial slogan of the forum. You can't unthink free thought. So um, I want to leave to that and um, say thanks again to Ms. Brittany Jones. And we hope to see her back on the forum relatively soon within the next few weeks or months. Thank you for having me on. And I would absolutely love to be back. I love okay. the conversation. <laughs> yes, we got a lot more to talk about, but um, there's only so much time in the day. But um, beautiful people. Up next, we have Jasmine Sherman. We're going to talk about their presidential campaign tomorrow. And this upcoming Monday, we have Randy J, who's an activist from Kenosha, Wisconsin. And we're going to talk a lot about um, mental illness, uh, homelessness, we got a lot of interesting topics um, in store and a lot of interesting guests down the road. So um, have a great day and we will talk soon. Cheers. Bye, guys.